and then FTX unravels and and all of that. And a lot of scrutiny comes on this bank that it shouldn't have been approved. It had all these deposits um, and weird stuff was going on there, basically. So I guess that's a recap of what Farmington was. Uh, but right before, essentially, like I think a few weeks before the whole FTX thing fell apart, um, Farmington teamed up with Fluent Finance. And Fluent Finance is this company that is essentially based around this stablecoin and stablecoin protocol, US Plus. It's a dollar pig stable coin. And up until this point, uh, SBF, FTX, and Delta, well, Deltex still is, you know, all involved with Tether. So why are they moving away from, you know, dollar peg stablecoin Tether to this other dollar peg stablecoin US Plus and getting involved with these guys? And I think, um, you know, one major goal of this particular article was to answer that question. So I guess I'll pause there and see where you want to take the convo from here. Yeah, I, guess, I guess I'm wondering... Like, if, what would have happened if FTX didn't fail? Like, would you have been able to write this article, do you think? Uh, yeah, probably, because uh, Sam Bankman fried would have been like, yeah, FTX has a stable coin, and it's called US+. Plus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and actually, right before, like a couple days before the collapse, I think it was like the 27th of October, um, Sam did a, an interview where he talked about how, you know, they're working on a stable coin, and, you know, they're looking for the right partner to do it, and there's pretty much no reason for them not to And they're one. going to announce soon yeah. something about a partnership with a stable coin issuer or something. And this is like a three day or like four day difference from when uh, Farmington Moonstone uh, announced their partnership with Fluent Finance. Yeah. I mean, stable, I mean, stable coins generally, it's been fascinating. Obviously you have Tether, which is the monster in the room and they've been around for quite Indeed. some time. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying yep. to figure out. Like, because the CBDC narrative has been out there for years. Stablecoins have been proliferating for years. And do you think this was always the intention to backdoor in the CBDCs via stablecoins? Or do you think the government and these like Fluent and R3 saw the success that Tether was happening and realized like, oh, this is the route we should go? I think always, I think always the, the, the way, I mean, you look at the way the, the government in general has kind of blurred the lines with the private and public sector, you know, uh, they reserve a lot more rights to restrict, you know, customer, you know, access, blacklist things, you know, if, if they kind of operate with a, with a private sector company, you know, I don't think the government actually wants to directly issue a CBDC. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, pain granular points that they have to deal with for doing that. They don't want to have retail accounts, you know, that they're directly responsible for. They want people to buy treasuries and keep this, you know, MIC Ponzi scheme, you know, going. Um, and so, yeah, I think I think that this was kind of always the plan. And I think now that we're starting to, you know, we're a little bit more zoomed out a year away from the FTX collapse. I think that, you know, you could kind of look at the FTX collapse as sort of the pillage before the foundation of the digital federal reserve. And now you're seeing Binance getting completely taken over by regulators. We have Tether onboarding the CIA and the FBI. Uh, they're blacklisting addresses at the behest of the, Amer you know, the American government. Uh, and they're like the biggest net buyers of treasuries of the US government. Uh, you know, they're like, top 20 country, you know, I think they're like 19th if they were a country of, of owners of, of T-bills. Um, I don't think any of that is an accident, personally. Uh, I definitely it's think funny. it's on purpose. It's funny with Tether, particularly. And I mean, Matt and I have been talking about this on Rabbit Hole Recap for five years now. Tether, Bitfinex has somewhat been uh, characterized as pirates of the industry, like operating in this regulatory gray zone for many years, allowing people to evade the long arm of the U.S. government and send U.S. dollar stable coins to each other without KYC, AML. And now, particularly with the onboarding of the Secret Service, the FBI, CIA, and the massive blacklisting that they've done over the last few months, it's like, oh shit, was this just a massive honeypot that's been building for for years? Like, did the Tether truthers actually have it all wrong? Like, I, the I, I think the Tether, the tether truthers... You. Do you still have your Bitcoin on an exchange? Don't hold your Bitcoin on exchange. Take it into self-custody. If you're looking for an easy way to do that, we have the BitKey. BitKey is Bitcoin made easy to use and hard to lose. Take the first step. Get your Bitcoin off the exchange. Check out the link in the show notes. That'll get you 20% off your BitKey or use the code TFTC20. The thing checkout. is like the greatest psyop ever because it really removes people. It's like the issue probably with Tether, 
which I think, you know, kind of is, is talked about in this article very much is that Tether is like a narrow bank, you know, it's this kind of one to one, they hold the treasuries for all the dollars that they create, they actually hold one to one. And the problem is with that is you can't do fractional reserve banking in the in the tether model. So we have to create rather than just using T bills that are held by Cantor Fitzgerald, you know, this incredibly spooky uh you know we can get into that later um you know they need to create this synthetic you know deposit security token that then they can rehypothecate and and basically recreate this fractional reserve banking system that uh, you know these these folks have enjoyed for you know years and years and years you know yeah. the reason jamie diamond was like with elizabeth warren was like we should ban all crypto if i was the government i would do that that's because the commercial banks like jp morgan want to be the the entities issuing the dollar pick staple coins or the whatever staple coins or deposit tokens they want to take you know the tether crowd and paolo and all of those guys that they, they want to do it they don't want these other companies to do it yeah it's makes complete sense and, i mean yeah. Percent. And these same, you know, a bank issued stable coin is still just as surveillable and programmable as like a hypothetical CBDC would be. But this one to one reserve thing is a big problem for them because the bank's whole, I mean, they want to keep their casino going. They need fractional reserve stuff uh, to follow their existing models, business model. They have no intention of changing that. And, it's, you know, when you keep in mind, too, that like in the in the States specifically, the central bank is owned by the Wall Street banks, like they're going to direct, obviously, what the central bank policy will be with respect to digital dollars, right? So, you know, there's a reason why I think the Fed has been so like, unwilling to be like, yeah, we're going to do a CBDC. They've been very like, you know, we don't know, we're not looking at it, you know, and there's people that have taken that as a sign that like the Fed is fighting against CBDCs, right? Um, but not so, not so. It's yeah, it just looks- one that's issued by, you know, the people that <laughs> we definitely know steal from, I mean, it's just a different group of thieves in charge of like programming and surveilling. Uh, but they, you know, are obviously going to collaborate with the same, with the government. It's going to be a public private partnership, essentially. 